Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us online or directly here in this room. We have the pleasure to um, have Professor Matthias Eger from uh, Switzerland, who is with us today at the invitation of Antoine, with whom he, he collaborates. So uh, it's really a pleasure to receive Matthias. Mat Mat Matthias is known to some of you through his work on meta-analysis, because you may have used this test. He's known to some of you for his long-standing work uh, uh, on, on HIV. He just reminded me that he, he kind of threw out the idea of having the HIV cohort with Francois Dabis and Mauro Chester from Brazil. So this was kind of the, the you, you're the father or the godfather of all those cohorts. Um, we know him through very productive collaboration with his team because he's the PI uh, for ID, the cohort ID, East, uh, South Africa, and, and, and as you know, Antoine is the PI for um, uh, ID West Africa. Uh, and so he's a well-known epidemiologist, infectious disease. And on top of that, he's the director, president of the Swiss National Research Science Foundation. So the Swiss ANR. So many, many reasons for which we are no, really uh, grateful for, uh, to, to have you here, Matthias. So the floor is yours. You will tell us about an important uh, thing of resistance to dolutegravir. As you know, this is the main antiretroviral drug used now in the world. So really looking forward to your talk and thanks again for uh, being with us. Donc, un, un grand merci Olivier pour cette uh, introduction très gentille. Um, C'est vraiment un plaisir d'être uh, de retour ici à Bordeaux. J'ai visité uh, pas mal de fois à l'époque uh, quand on a travaillé sur ArtLink, tu as mentionné avec uh, François Dabis. So I'll change to English, and uh, because I've been asked, I need to, to give this talk in English. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about dolutegravir resistance within the IDEA project. So IDEA is, as you mentioned, the international epidemiology databases to evaluate AIDS, which is a project that, um, of course, Antoine is leading together with colleagues um, the West African region. And we are in Bern involved with the University of Cape Town for the Southern African region. So let's see how this works. So I'm going to um, talk about four studies, and all these studies are linked to IDEA. I'm going to talk about quite a few unpublished data uh, and preliminary data that need careful interpretation. I want to say this at the outset. I'm not going to talk about the cardiometabolic um, adverse effects of dolutegravir. It, it, you know, there's only so much. So the background to this is that, uh, as you all know, HIV drug resistance is seen as a threat to the UN um, goal of um, ending the HIV AIDS epidemic as a public health problem by 2030. By 2016, the widely used at that time NNRTI um, antiretroviral regimens um, experienced really a drug resistance epidemic, if you like, and you see it on these, on these graphs. This is a systematic review by uh, Gupta, which documents very nicely in the different regions this increase in NNRTI pretreatment drug resistance. So the question is, um, is the integrase strand inhibitor, um, dolutegravir, um, going to solve this problem long term? Uh, the drug was approved in 2013, and in 2016, the WHO recommended it not only for first line, but also for second line and for third line ART. And this sort of multiplicity of roles um, may be problematic, but the drug does have a much higher uh, genetic barrier to resistance compared to the NNRTIs. So the DTG uptake study is a study that asked clinics 
175 of them across the world and you see the clinics as these grey points here, they're not very visible, but there are many uh, across um, uh, many countries. Um, the clinics were asked, do you use ART in first and in second line? Um, what is the role of viral load measurement when you switch people from NNRTI-based regimens to um, dolutegravir-based regimens? And do you do any genotypic drug resistance testing? Okay. So the results uh, you, see, you see here. Um, in 2020, most clinics had introduced dolutegravir or TLD um, in first line. And about 40%, it's not on the slide, had introduced it in uh, second line. And there was an association with country income. So the higher the country income, uh, actually, the fewer people had it at that time as first line. And you see that about 60% required viral load testing before switching to TLD, and also there was an association with the national HIV prevalence. The higher the prevalence, the more likely TLD was used in first line, and with level of care, the lower the level of care, the higher the probability of first line. And only about 15% said they would um, perform genotypic resistance testing when switching patients. So another study was the DTG switch study in Zambia and Malawi. And this was a study that basically followed up mainly women, because at that time when it was done, the men had already been switched. Um, after switching from NNRTI-based ART to Tolotegravir-based ART. And you see the sample size was quite substantial, almost uh, you know, close to 3,000 people in the two countries. And you see that most of these um, women were in stage one, so they didn't have advanced uh, HIV disease, but they were on ART for quite a while, six years, the median, and most of them switched to TLD. And we did a follow-up at one and two years after, switched, uh, after the switching, and we looked at viremia and drug resistance uh, mutations, DRMs. So what we found was that in Malawi, more people were viremic, more women mainly, viremic at um, switch um, than in Zambia. And the reason for that was that in Zambia, only women were switched who had a viral load below 1,000 copies per mil um, in the past six months. So there was a um, selection, uh, a criterion for switching in Zambia, which said you need a recent undetectable or below 1,000 to be uh, precise um, virolog virologic uh, viral load measurement. Whereas in Malawi, people were switched blindly, just routinely uh, without looking at the viral load. So you see this in the flow chart here. So there were more people with a viral load above 400 in Malawi than in Zambia, but you also see that many of these actually then became undetectable. You see that curve here, and you see that some people developed viremia while being undetectable at baseline and one year. So there's a lot going on up there, but the end result is that at two years there were still more people viremic in Malawi than in Zambia. And missing viral load measurements um, was an issue in both sites, but particularly in Malawi, that's the grey um, 
area that you see on the flow diagram. So when we did a logistic regression, we found that men were more, more likely after switch to be uh, viremic, and also younger age, as you'd expect, um, is associated with viremia. And if you were viremic at baseline, you were more likely, and you see these odds ratios here, six, seven, uh, much more likely to be uh, viremic at one year or at two years. And also, the policy in Malawi um, to switch people blindly may have increased the risk of viremia later on. You see here the analysis showing that in Zambia this risk is, um, the odds ratio is about uh, 0.5, so it's uh, substantially lower. Now we also did, as I said, genotypic resistance testing, and here you see the four cases in Malawi and the one case in Zambia with drug resistance mutations to uh, dolutegravir. And you see that two of these had major mutations. These are the mutations that translate into intermediate or high levels of resistance. Um, and yeah, it's rare. That is the, uh, that is the mes message. And you also see that there was some um, resistance in the NRTI backbone and also in NRTI mutations. These mutations, keep them a little bit in mind. The E138K, for example, you will meet that mutation again later on. Also the G118R, they are mutations that uh, we will encounter in uh, the rest of this talk. So now let's go to the large DTG resist study, which is a study funded separately by um, the NIH, but within the IDEA network. The IDEA network is really a nice framework or platform to do additional studies like DTG resist. So the aims are listed on this slide. It's really about what uh, drug resistance mutations do emerge in non-B HIV subtypes. A lot of work has been done on DTG resistance in um, B um, uh, HIV subtypes, but the question is whether they, are, they differ, and also to identify risk factors for virologic failure, and for uh, drug resistance mutations, etc. And to investigate um, to what extent novel resistance genotypes that we may find um, are really providing phenotypic uh, drug resistance across the different uh, subtypes. So one part of this study was a analysis, a meta-analysis, Olivier mentioned meta-analysis, essentially a meta-analysis of existing cohort data um, across several cohorts, and you see the paper that was recently published last year in Lancet HIV. So we basically identified, it was a cross-sectional data set, it's important, although it came from cohort studies, eight cohorts from Europe, Canada, and South Africa contributed data, and these data were of patients who failed a dolutegravir um, based regimen and who had a genotypic resistance test. So it is a study sample uh, which we really need to understand because there are, a lot of, there are a lot of selection processes to get to the 599. 32 of them were exposed to first generation INSTIS and the majority was uh, subtype B, as you'd expect from cohorts from Europe and, and Canada. There was one South African cohort. Um, you see that we found in these almost 600 patients, 87 with at least one INSTI um, drug resistant mutation and 22 for 3.7% 
had a major insti drug resistance mutation. You see the regimens they were on when they developed a failure. You see that about 70% were on a dolutegravir with two NRTIs. But there were also people on DTG monotherapy or DTG dual therapy. And when you look at the risk of um, developing resistance, so this, this, this is the output from the Stanford algorithm, and uh, it shows that an important risk factor was dual therapy or monotherapy. You see these massive false ratios here. And other, another really important risk factor was having a um, backbone that wasn't fully functional, so NRTI resistance. And you see again, these were quite substantially increased um, risks to develop dolutegravir resistance if your backbone wasn't working. And that is, of course, an important finding in the context of um, African uh, ART programs where we know that there is, as I showed on my first slide, there's a very high um, prevalence of uh, NRTI resistance. So there's concern that many people will actually um, be at an increased risk of developing dolutegravir resistance because of their issue with the backbone. Um, just briefly, again, you see uh, the distribution of the different major uh, drug resistance mutations. You see again the E38K, um, the R263K is also quite uh, prevalent in this data set. And you see it stratified by whether people were exposed to first generation INSTI or not. And there was no clear association, which was a bit surprising, no clear association of specific um, drug resistant mutations with first generation INST experience. You also saw that on, uh, on, this, on this graph, first generation INSTI wasn't really doing much. Okay? So, this was the analysis of existing cohort data. We will repeat this in about a year to, see, you know, to get more data and uh, look at this in more detail. But now let's talk a little bit about the prospective part of the DTG Resist uh, study, which is really prospectively recruiting people living with HIV on DTG-based ART who develop virologic failure, defined as above a thousand copies. And you see the countries that participate and you also see on the graph the diversity in HIV subtypes. That is, of course, one of the objectives of the study, to have this diversity and examine um, drug resistance mutations according to HIV um, subtype. So at the time of failure, um, which is defined um, as above 1,000 copies, um, you basically either go directly into the study visit and you have a plasma or a DBS sample taken, or depending on the program, you have viral failure confirmed in the next routine visit. The shipment of the samples to the labs um, is uh, done by courier, it's very expensive by the way, and at the lab, it is checked whether the viral load is actually above 1,000. And then um, there is Sanger sequencing, and we are also hoping to be able to do uh, whole genome uh, sequencing later on. Just briefly, another aim of this study is, as I said, to look at um, resistance uh, patterns uh, that are uh, unexpected and to actually look at phenotypic resistance in um, unusual combinations of genotypic resistance mutations. Um, and we're doing this in collaboration with a company in the US. And 
in collaboration with investigators at ETH in Zurich, we are um, analyzing pathways to resistance. And what we can already say is that often you have several mutations that get you to high levels of resistance. One exception is the 263. There, um, one mutation actually gets you there in one go. Um, but there are these pathways that we will be exploring. So these data are based on the uh, retrospective uh, data and this is work in progress. So these are all the countries that participate and you see that some countries are still you know, coming on board, so uh, open for recruitment, but Tanzania hasn't recruited any patients and India is still waiting for uh, the green light to be able to participate in this study. But it's quite an impressive um, uh, set of uh, sites and countries that participate in DTG Resist. So enrollment progress um, by IDEA region, and you see West Africa is in green, is also contributing patients. Uh, Southern Africa is contributing more. Also, Central Africa has contributed quite a few patients. On average, we enroll per day about 1 to 1.5 patients. And we are now, um, actually today, at 571. And we would like to get to above 1,000 by the end of this year, mid next year. So this graph shows you how um, people switch. Um, you see that in first line, almost everyone switches to TLD and um, many from effavirance-based um, first line. In second line, the situation is more complicated, but again, the majority switches to TLD. And in third line, it's quite messy, um, but there are few patients. Now let's look at the, um, viral, uh, the, the, the lab results. And so far, our lab in uh, Durban, the KwaZulu-Natal uh, sequencing platform lab, has received 196 samples. This is ongoing work. And what you see here is that half of these were actually not um, eligible. They were not, about half, half of the samples resuppressed. Okay? And the ones that so far have been um, sequenced um, are 65, and 11 of these 65 have at least one, many have several, as you'll see in a minute, um, major insti uh, drug resistance mutations. So here is the list, and again you see these um, mutations that you saw before. Uh, you see the viral load at the time. Um, you see that many of these had prior NNRTI failure. And uh, you see the regimens that they, were, uh, that they were on when failing. The next slide shows you that many of them had NRTI uh, drug-resistant mutations. Really, a whole... Um, you know, the whole range uh, of, of uh, NRTI DRMs are uh, here. And actually, note that there's not a single patient who didn't have NRTI drug resistance mutations. And what I said before, that this is an important issue, uh, is sort of borne out in these, in these data. NNRTI drug resistance mutations are also prevalent, not PI. These are just a slide to show you what, what the um, most common, and it's again the E138A or K, um, and often in combination, as you see on the right of the, of the graph. 
So these are just two cases that I quickly wanted to, uh, to show you. This is a 42-year-old female who was enrolled in February um, last year and uh, who's been on ART for a very long time and who was exposed, which is not common in our data, but this person was exposed to first generation uh, in sterile tecrovir and um, was then switched um, to a PI-based regimen and suppressed. So we also are in contact with these clinics and feed the results back um, as soon as we can and discuss the treatment, and that's mainly Richard Lessels, our clinician who does that, discusses the treatment and gives advice. Here is another case. Uh, we don't know the outcome here yet. Um, we are uh, again in contact uh, with the clinic that uh, uh, looks after this patient. So you see, again, switched to uh, Darunavir. Um, but we don't know yet whether this will work. So let me finish with a study that is in progress, which we called uh, the MARISA study, modeling antiretroviral drug resistance in South Africa. So we're now zooming in on South Africa. And we use a model that a PhD student, uh, together with uh, a group in, in Zurich, with Roger Cuyos, developed. Um, which is this model, and we extended it to dolutegravir. Uh, it has four layers, care cascade, disease progression, drug resistance evolution, and sex. And it has been calibrated uh, to the South African uh, HIV epidemic. Now, these are first results from this model. And they basically stipulate that we will see a quite substantial increase in dolutegravir resistance in the years to come, depending mainly on how long people spend on a failing dolutegravir regimen. So you see, um, if you only, in inverted commas, spend six months, then the increase um, would be... Um, much less than when you spend um, a much longer time, uh, 1.5 years, that's this curve up here. You also see that the confidence intervals are really wide, so there's a lot of uncertainty at the moment, um, but it is worrying. You also see on the graph below that the NNRTI resistance is declining, as you'd expect, because no one is on it and the dolutegravir overall uh, resistance uh, is um, uh, increasing. We're talking about transmitted drug resistance on this graph and acquired drug resistance here. So in conclusion, dolutegravir has really been scaled up quite quickly. In idea, um, after the guideline change, really within about two years, most of the clinics had transferred their patients, their first-line patients, um, uh, in, 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 to, to uh, dolutegravir-based ART, uh, more than half in, in second line. But about in 40% in 40, in 40 of the clinics, patients were switched blindly. So without uh, monitoring of viral load, and genotypic resistance testing was really rare. And to be, you know, positive, in these patients who are switched on first-line ART, there were very few, that's what the DTG, DTG switch study showed, really few people developed um, dolutegravir uh, uh, resistance. It is possible the comparison between Zambia and Malawi indicates that, that if you do viral load monitoring and you only switch patients below a thousand copies, you may actually prevent viremia and possibly um, drug resistance development later on. 
which is of course what uh, WHO recommends, but it isn't done um, widely. Now, important in our study, you can have a viral load above 1,000, but a few weeks or months later, when you actually enrolled in the study, you may be suppressed again. Again, good news. The INSTI drug resistance mutation patterns that we see um, are um, mostly seen in treatment experienced individuals who have multiple INSTI DRMs and also who have a existing multi-class drug resistance uh, in their backbone and, the, and also many have NNRTI resistance. What's going to happen? It is really unclear, but our modeling um, indicates it may become a problem. Um, if we go back to that slide here, that um, transmitted drug resistance by about 2040 will actually reach that 10% um, threshold that WHO has defined as where you should change the regimen. Of course, there may be other drugs coming until then, as we discussed Chill last night. Uh, so it is not all bleak, but it is a real possibility this will happen. So it will be a particular problem, obviously, in resource-limited settings where HIV um, viral load monitoring is limited. Uh, we, we've seen an idea that viral load monitoring is actually going down. And um, where switching options, where people really stay a long time on a failing regimen and are not switched, in this case, to a um, PI-based uh, regimen. There's also some indication that this risk may be higher in non uh, B HIV 1. So, with this, I want to thank a really huge team of people who are involved in these studies the involved study sites, the idea regions, the sequencing centers, and our funders, the NIH and the Swiss National Science Foundation. And thank you for your attention. <laughs>